What's going on everyone? Happy Sabbath to you. Sam here. I hope you've had a great week. We've already started this journey talking about activated without an E. Here's what God wants to do for this generation. He wants to activate it in order for it to get ready for him. Every aspect, every area of your life, God wants to be a part of it. The question is, how does that happen? What should you do? And what does God want to do for you? That's what each message is about as we talk about activated without an E. Last week, the E that we were trying to get rid of in your life was excuses. Everybody has excuses. And if you allow them to keep coming into your life, if you allow them to come into your vocabulary, if you allow them to crowd your thoughts, those excuses will deactivate whatever God is trying to do in your life. Today, the E that we are trying to remove from your life, or at least help you understand, is exclusivity. What does it mean to be exclusive? What does it mean to set yourself apart from others? What does it mean to push people out? What does it mean for one generation to be different from another? These are the things that we're going to discuss in today's session. Activated without an E, exclusivity. Now, it's interesting that last week we spoke about the woman with the issue of blood. Well, guess what? The story continues today. Whereas she overcame excuses in her life, today we will see a young lady, or at least her father, overcome exclusivity in his life. Let me begin by saying, we serve an inclusive God. We will see how inclusive God is when you look at how he dealt with Jairus and how he dealt with the woman with the issue of blood. There are very few stories in the Bible where two people's lives intersect, but they never actually meet each other. This story has a ruler of the synagogue with a daughter who's sick and near death. It also has a woman who has a problem for 12 years. Now, I want to make some comparisons between Jairus and this woman for you to understand that God is inclusive. First of all, Jairus is a ruler of the synagogue. He is a respected man. We know his name. But when you look at this woman, she wasn't allowed to go to the synagogue. We don't know her name. All we know is her problem. But this woman represents those that are marginalized, those that feel like they're outsiders. Jairus represents the insiders who have the privilege and they have the advantages and they have the access. But we see God entertaining both of them in ways that make for a beautiful story. We don't know whether they spoke at the end of this drama. We don't know whether they exchanged experiences about what Jesus had done. But what we do know is that Christ was available for both of them. The Bible says that a young girl is sick and to the point of death. It was Jairus who came to the front of the line seeking out Jesus. Now I want to compare Jairus' daughter with this woman. It's interesting that the Bible says that she had this issue of blood for 12 years. How old was Jairus' daughter? She was 12 years old. So that means 12 years earlier, a woman and a man walked out of a hospital with a baby. And while they were walking out, a woman walked in and she had a health problem that turned out to be a 12 year nightmare. So that means as this little girl was growing up, becoming whatever she was becoming, her parents were taking care of her, meeting her needs. But on the other side of town is a woman with a sickness, with an issue that was draining the life out of her. If you will allow me, I want to compare these two women, the, the woman with the issue of blood and this young girl whose name we don't know. I want to look at them representing generations. The woman with the issue of blood represents the generation that has been. This young girl represents the generation to be. So throughout the message, I'm talking to the parents, I'm talking to the teachers, I'm talking to the leaders, but I'm also talking to the followers, the young people, the millennials, the Generation Z, the ones who are to take over in the future. The woman represents the generation that is dying, that is bleeding out slowly. The young girl represents the generation that is coming, 
and is affected by the generation that has passed. The Bible says in Luke chapter 8 and verse 49, while he was still speaking to her, Jesus is speaking to the woman. He is talking to her about what has taken place. She has touched the hem of his garment and now she has been healed. But Jesus is still on his way to Jairus' house. That pause that happened with her miracle is also a challenge in his life. Because the Bible says, somebody came from his house and told him, your daughter is dead. There is no use troubling the teacher now. Somebody said it well. One generation is coming and another generation is dying. I want to use this metaphor, if you'll allow me, to help you understand that since the beginning of time, there's always been a generation gap between the old and the young. This gap is seen in society. This gap is seen in politics. This gap is seen in the social issues that the world deals with. This gap is seen in the home. It's seen in schools. It's seen even in God's house, where the older people are afraid of what the next generation will become. And the younger generation looks at the older people and says, we can't learn anything from what you're doing. And so while one generation is bleeding out and dying, the younger generation is also in trouble. But I thank God that there's a solution for both, and that solution is Jesus Christ. That's why I say this story is an intersection of different generations, different classes, different gender, but they all have one common denominator, and that is God. You see, the devil wants to deactivate the older generation. By deactivating the parents, by deactivating the teachers, by deactivating the leaders, he kills off the younger generation. Somebody comes from Jairus' house and says, it's over, she's dead. Let's give up on her. Even though Jesus is on his way to her house, let's give up, it, it can be fixed. I want you to listen to the statement about inclusiveness. Vernon Mayer says, diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. I like that. See, young people are being invited to the party. They're, they're allowed to sit at the table. They're allowed to be a part of the comedies. They're allowed to be a part of the crowd. But the question is, have they been given a chance to get on the dance floor and show what they have? Or are there concerns about what they bring? Are there concerns about the way they dress? Are there concerns about their music? And so we keep them at a distance. And when they die out, we say, it's okay. It has happened. Let it go. But Jesus does not answer them. Instead, he looks at Jairus, the man who came with the prayer, and he says to him, don't be afraid. My friends, I want you to know that fear is an enemy when trying to breeze the generation gap, when trying to deal with this exclusivity. Why do people class themselves according to race, according to tribe, according to their status? It's because of fear. One group is afraid of the other. The older are afraid of what the young will do to the message. The younger don't get what the older are doing, and so they're afraid to speak up. And so this gap grows wider, and Jesus says, don't be afraid. It is fear of one generation that has manifested in bad decisions that have left the next generation in trouble. So what am I saying? I'm saying, don't allow fear to widen the gap between the older and the younger. Why am I talking about this? Because it is a persistent problem that exists even today. Jesus says, don't be afraid, just have faith. She will be healed. He was sure. And the same Jesus who was sure more than 2000 years ago is sure today. He is still available. He is still as powerful. He is still able to raise those who have died when it comes to their life, when it comes to their reputation, when it comes to the things they're going through. He is alive. He is able to give power. If he could stop the bleeding in that old generation, surely he can bring the young generation back to life. The Bible says when they got to the house, look at what Jesus does. He stopped everybody from going in, except Peter, John, and James, and the girl's parents. See, there's a message right there. In life, there are two crowds you must deal with. The first crowd, I call it the outer crowd. 
The outer crowd are the people who don't belong to your group. They don't belong to your circle. They're not part of the family. They're not a part of the clique. They're not a part of the movement. They're not a part of the church. In the Old Testament, they're called the mixed multitude, those who think like the world and bring their ideas in. These people, like in the story, are the ones who will tell you, it's over, she's dead, forget about it. Forget about faith, it doesn't work, it's old fashioned, it's not the answer. Be careful of the outer crowd. And so when Jesus gets to Jairus' house, the Bible says that he keeps everybody out except Peter, James, and John. Let me pause for a second to say, please remember Jesus had 12 disciples. Why is he only taking three with him? Does he not love the other nine? Does he not value their contribution? I am sure he does. If there's anything we know about God, he does not practice favoritism. But obviously, he looked into the future and he saw that these three men would be pivotal to the work that he was doing. And remember, the disciples were a young generation. And so Jesus takes these three in with him. These three that would be the spokesmen in the book of Acts. These three that would write books which would echo the life of Christ. But he also takes the little girl's parents. There's a message for a mother. There's a message for a father. If there's anybody who can help the generation that is to come, if there's anybody that can help the young people, Generation Z, Millennials, whatever you want to call them, the ones who can help are those in the home, the guardians, the providers, those who give shelter, those who give opportunity. You're the ones that God is saying, remove exclusivity and let these young people be. And so Jesus takes the mother, the father, Peter, James, and John. The house is filled with people who are wailing and weeping because you see, whenever somebody dies, there are people who will come and cry for you. In those days, they would pay people to cry. And so the house is full of people who are weeping. Jesus says, stop weeping. She is not dead. She is only asleep. Is only asleep. It's interesting that the life has left her body, but Jesus still believes he can do something. Is it possible that this young generation that we are worried about, this young generation that we feel is going nowhere, is it possible that God says they're not dead, they're just sleeping, and I'm here to wake them up? Is it possible that you've given up on the children too soon? Is it possible that you've decided that they're too far out to be saved, and yet Jesus says they're not dead, they're just sleeping? But listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says from weeping, the crowd starts to laugh at him because they knew she had died. Luke chapter 8, verse 53, the crowd laughed at him. How did they move from weeping to laughter? It's simple. They were in the room, but they were not there for the right reason. Not everybody that cries with you understands what you're going through. Not everybody that laughs with you understands what, you, what you're being joyous about. Be weary of the crowd because the inside crowd is also a problem. These are people in the house. These are family members, friends, and they're laughing at what Jesus is about to do. But I thank God for who Jesus is because once again, he does something unusual. And then the Bible says he took the little girl by the hand and he said with a loud voice, my child, get up. My child, get up. See, the outer crowd, he ignored them. In fact, he kicked them out. The inner crowd, he ignored them. And he went straight to this young lady. I want somebody that is watching to understand what I'm saying today. People may give up on you, but God never gives up on you. If you don't get that message, you've missed the whole point of the whole sermon. Because Christ will walk through a crowd a crowd of people who have all their own issues to deal with, but he will head over to you because he understands that you need to be woken up. And he says to her, my child. She is the daughter of Jairus, but in this moment, she is God's child. And he says to her, get up. Listen, one more time. He told them to get out, but he told her to get up. He told them to get out, but he told her to get up. What's the idea? Some things won't get up until some things get out. Why is it that you're not activated? Why is it that your life is not going in the direction it should go? Why are you not on fire for the Lord? 
Why is it that you call on his name, but his name is not a part of what you do? It's simple. There's things that are blocking you from experiencing what God wants to do in your life. And so once again, some things won't get up until some things get out. And the Bible says at that moment, her life returned and she immediately stood up. And then Jesus told them, give her something to eat. Give her something to eat. See, as a Bible student, I've learned that every part of a text, there's a message in it. There's always something that you can learn from. Why was it important that she eat food after that experience? How long has she been laying down? You know that when you're sick, the one thing that you experience is physical weakness, fatigue. You just feel lazy. You just feel like doing nothing. And this young girl, not only has she been sleeping, she has been dead. And now that she's awake, Jesus says to the crowd, he says to the parents, all I want you to do is give her food to eat. See, there is a hunger that can only be met by Christ. And then there's a hunger that you and I can be a part of. Listen to the statement. There's a hunger that won't be met with empty criticism. Jesus does not criticize this young girl. He doesn't accuse her of being the reason why she's been sick. He doesn't look at her life and her habits as a child, as a teen, and question her. He simply looks at the parents and says, she needs to eat something. There's a hunger that will not be met with generational comparisons. Again, as a pastor, this is what breaks my heart when I look at God's church. That people keep looking at what the older generation has been doing versus what the younger generation is doing. you got young people looking at the older people and saying, we can't get anything from you we got the older generation saying, don't mess this up for us. That hunger that the young people feel will not be met with comparison. It will be met with compassion. It will be met with the truth. It will be met with convictions that can only come from God. The third idea I want to share with you. There is a hunger that will not be met with debates and discussions that go over the heads of the young people. What am I talking about? I've been in churches, four different countries, I've been in churches, and I watched the older generation debate on issues regarding what the Bible says. And the young people are sitting in the audience wondering, what is there for me? What am I to learn from this experience? Their hunger for God will not be met with criticism, with comparison, or with debates. So how do you meet their hunger? Give them the word of God where they are. If you want to activate the young people, give them the word of God where they are. And that's what Christ is offering. The Bible says that he healed this woman with the issue of blood. He wakes up this little girl and them both, two generations are healed. God is not for the old generation. He's not for the young generation. He is not for the conservatives. He is not for the liberal. He is not for those who do things differently versus whoever. He is for those who are willing to follow him wherever he goes. And so I'm saying to you, to get activated, let's remove exclusivity. Is being exclusive a bad thing? Let me give you the other side of it before I pray for you. Here's the idea I want you to understand. Christ is inclusive when it comes to loving everybody but it's exclusive when it comes to what you believe. Because what you believe matters. The life you lead matters. And so, somebody said, is Jesus liberal and is Jesus conservative? And my answer was, when it comes to loving people, he is liberal. But when it comes to what he teaches, he is very conservative. But what do we do? We switch it over. We become very conservative when it comes to loving people, but very liberal about what we believe. We hold it so dearly that we would rather push people out than accept that they're different. God is an inclusive God. And he says, if you want to activate what's going on in your life right now, even during these times we're in, with all this mess, he says, I can activate you as long as you surrender to me. You are activated when you get up. So while you're watching this message, you're probably seated in your home right now. But I want you to know that God wants you to get up, not from your seat, but from whatever excuses, whatever exclusivity, whatever things that were going on in your life that have kept him out, 
the things that have kept the generations apart, the things that have kept tribes apart, the things that have kept genders apart. Jesus says, I want you to be inclusive by having me as the common denominator. So what should you do? Get up, and before you get up, get some things out. Let me pray with you. So there's somebody on the other side of this camera. There's somebody on the other side of the screen who is thinking to themselves, what is it that's holding me back right now? What is it that's preventing me from being my best self for the sake of the will of God? What is it that I can do that will make a difference to the people around me? And God says, you need to get up. If there's anyone or anything holding you back, he says, kick them out the room. Love them, care for them, provide for them, but kick them out. Why? Because you need to be at the place where God wants you to be. And I pray that God will activate your life to the status that he requires. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this word. You have shown us that you are there for the old, you are there for the young. You will take care of those who are dying, you will take care of those who are dead. Those who have things in their lives that have died, you are able to revive. And so I pray, Father, in this moment, that they may experience the joy, the nourishment, your presence, everything that you bring is available. All they have to do, as you said to Jairus, don't be afraid, have faith. Bless each and every person that is listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us on this uh, uh, program, Activated Without an E. And I pray that God will help you not only remove the excuses in your life, but also help you to be exclusively His, but to be inclusive of those that need Him. Until the next one, may the Lord be with you and activate you. See you next time.